Alrighty, folks. They originally told me to plan for 30 minutes, so I'm going to, uh, on my own, zap a whole bunch of slides here, and I'll, I'll get you down. If you're like me, your bladder's about ready to start swimming here anyway. <laughs> We have primarily two catfish species in Minnesota, and the primary ones that we chase are the champ cat and the bigger flathead catfish. When we're talking catfish, we're talking big fish now. And I mean big fish, kind of try to pull you right out of the boat. Champ catfish, state records 38 pounds. It was caught in northeast Minneapolis back in 1975. The flathead catfish, state record is 70 pounds was caught in the St. Croix River near Marine on the St. Croix back in 1970. So when we're talking catfish, the reason I keep bringing this up is, this is what most of us are chasing. That's a flathead catfish that's over 50 pounds. This is a channel cat caught in St. Croix. It was a 35 inch one with a 25 inch girth. The thing I want to talk about now is the primary catfish fishing waters in Minnesota. The best known waters are the Red River, the Minnesota River, the Mississippi River, and the St. Croix River. And the thing most Minnesotans don't understand is we have in Minnesota some of the premier catfishing waters in the entire country. And there's fishermen, cat fishermen from all over the country that just drool when they, they see the fish coming out of the Minnesota River and the Mississippi and some out of the St. Croix. Unfortunately, the Mississippi River and the St. Croix Rivers are designated as infested waters due to Eurasian water milfoil and zebra mussels. Early last summer, I got a call and said, inviting me to join a catfish work group, and I was all over that. Uh, most of us catfish guys have wanted a seat at this table for years. We wanted the opportunity to, to get up here and voice some of our issues and our concerns because Believe it or not, the way we fish is totally different than anything you guys do, the majority of anglers do. We've had three meetings to date. The meetings have all been held at the Hutchinson Fisheries Office, and they've been hosted by Jack Lauer, the Southern Regional Fisheries Manager. The work group is made up of about, about a dozen catfish angler representatives, and then Jack's mixed and matched DNR people to kind of help us as we work through each of our meetings. That first meeting was back in June, on the 14th of June. And that meeting was kind of a, a rough get to know each other and a chance to kind of just all of us kind of vent. What are, what are the issues that, are, that were affecting us as cat fishermen and as DNR people that were working in the, in the catfish fisheries? And so we just, each of us got up and put on the wall our five key issues. Well, when you get that many people, you can imagine at the end of that meeting, we had a, a spread across the wall, and we said, well, you know, there's a lot to digest there. So Jack kind of said to us all, between this first meeting and our next meeting, let's think about group issues. Let's try to get down to three or four things that we as a catfish work group can focus on, and what do we consider to be the key issues facing us. Our second meeting was on the 29th of September, and Jack did one thing here that we all liked. He added conservation officers to the work group. We had two enforcement officers there that helped us focus on our issues and look at them from the enforcement side of the business. At the conclusion of this second meeting, we had boiled it down to three key issues that the group consensus wanted to focus on. The very first one was aquatic invasive species. We've been hearing about that a lot today. But I gotta tell you that the AIS program significantly impacts on the catfish angler and the way that we traditionally fish. And it primarily hang, hit us in the bait harvest arena. When you can when you're a cat fisherman, it's all about the bait. It's it's what we consider bait is nothing close to what the majority of people consider bait. And the other issues we looked at, let me back up again, was the types of bait that we use and our bait harvest techniques. So this was what the primary focus issue was of our work group. And it's what we teed all our efforts 
this line. Many of us, when we go out to fish, we'll go out early, and we'll spend 45 minutes to an hour at the front end of a trip catching our bait. And I'm going to show you in a minute what we consider to be bait. But people say to me, well, just go to the bait shop and buy some bait. Well, I fish in the summer. I'm a retired Army colonel. Worked hard my whole life so I could retire. And I fish four to five nights a week. I get the Twins game on the radio. I get on my favorite cat water. I put out my rods. I listen to the Twins game. Cuss at Kadir every time he hits into a double play. That's how I spend my evening. Well, here is, this is a Minnesota statute, 84D03, and it covers bay harvest from infested waters. You remember I said the Mississippi River and the St. Croix River are infested waters. Right now, let me get this next slide. We talk about bait, all right? This is bait to a typical angler. You go down to the bait shop and get a scoop of fathead minnows, maybe you get some shiners, get some sucker minnows, smaller sucker minnows, and that's bait. That's bait to a catfisherman. That's a 10 inch bullhead. That thing will stay alive all night. You throw a 10 knot hook in him, put a nice 3, 4 ounce weight on there, and you can put him out there and he's going nuts all night in the water like that. And that's what's attracting those big flathead catfish. And that's what we, as cat fishermen, consider bait. This is what the majority of fishermen consider bait. This is a, oh, a 12 to 14 inch sucker. If we can get those, they're a great bait. Okay, if guys say to me, well, you can buy those at the bait shop. Just stop down at the bait shop, buy yourself some 8, eight inch, 12 inch suckers. An 8 inch plus sucker minnow cost you a buck and a half a piece. 18 bucks a dozen. Fish four or five nights a week. Tell me you're going to spend 18 bucks a dozen on sucker minnows. And when you buy them, you put them in the bucket, you get there and lift the cover off the bucket, and six of them are floating belly up, and the other four or five, six are all sucking air, and you're uh, trying to keep them alive. So this is a tough bait. This is a bait. Guys say, geez, what is that? That's a sheep's head. Boy, they're a great bait. What's that? Moon eye. Moon eye. Ooh, awesome bait. <laughs> And I'm one of these guys, I drool at bait. You know, I get excited, I get fired up about bait. Because bait to us, isn't it, Brian? It's hard to get. It's hard. Quality bait's hard to get, and especially the bait that's coming right out of the river where you're fishing. You want to know where people say to me, what are some of your best fishing spots? The same spot I catch bait, I come back there that night. I mean, if I'm catching bait out of there, who else do you think's eating out of there? Those big guys. What's this one? Gold eye. Up on the red, this is a, a pretty good bait to have up there. Oh, this is an awesome bait. <laughs> okay. It's not legal in Minnesota. Okay? But I gotta tell you right now, this is an awesome bait. Catfish eat those like popcorn. Okay? Now on the St. Croix River this year, as long as I'm in Wisconsin territorial waters, I can use that for bait, because in Wisconsin they're legal to use. So this was the first year I ever started using, using them. I used to hear, listen, guys would tell me, boy, those sunfish are great bait. And I always used to think, gee, someday I want to try them. Well, this summer I found out, hey, tomorrow you can do that. And I started fishing them this summer. Awesome bait. I keep a boat in a marina on the St. Croix. I can sit in my boat inside of my slip and catch a, catch a bucket of sunfish and go fishing, as long as I'm in the Wisconsin waters. Take that Lake Master chip, Anchor yourself right on the boundary line and put out your rods. Okay? <laughs> this is another way that we fish. This is a 14 to 15 inch sucker. You take that thing, you run a nice fillet off, and you take a game shear and you hunk him up just like that. And you put that in the water with the blood and the juices flowing down the current, and the channel cats will pick that up and swim right up to your bait and find it. This particular bait right here, later this evening, put five big channel cats in the boat. That's how we fish, especially when we're chasing channel cats. Now, what's the rub? The rub is the Aquatic Invasive Species Program. This is taken right off of the DNR's website. The program goals prevent the introduction of new species into Minnesota and prevent the spread of invasive species and reduce the impact 
caused by invasive species to the Minnesota Ecology Society and Economy. I want you to know that cat fishermen, we fully support the AIS program. But right now, it's causing us some real trouble. This is Minnesota statute. I don't know, some of you probably can't read it back there. Minnesota statute 84D03, infested waters, restricted activities. Subdivision three, bait harvest from infested waters. This paragraph right here, taking wild from infested waters for bait is prohibited. What does that mean? It means you can't do it. Well, I told you before, we want to catch bait in the waters that we're fishing, and this prohibits it. Then, when we looked at this regulation, in subparagraph B, in waters that are designated as infested waters, taking wild animals may be permitted for, and then down here it says bait purposes, for non-commercial personal use in waters that contain Eurasian water milfoil, when the infested waters are designated solely because they contain Eurasian water milfoil, and if the equipment for taking is limited to cylindrical minnow traps. So they, they put a provision in the law to allow people to gather bait. They allow you guys to gather bait, but you sure aren't going to get a 14-inch sucker in a 16-inch track. Okay? The other problem is the Mississippi River and the St. Croix River are contaminated with zebra mussel. So this regulation doesn't apply to that. I got a little curious as I started to do the research for this particular program, for our issue. I started calling people and asking a lot of questions. So I went to enforcement and I asked them, since the inception of that statute, how many citations or violations have been issued by DNR enforcement for bait harvest violations? In the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2010, there was one summons and 13 warnings. In the fiscal year ending this summer, 6.30 of 2011, there were eight warnings. Of all of those, the one summons and the 21 warnings, only three of them were not on the Mississippi River or the St. Croix. So what does that say? They're enforcing it. So far, they've been doing warnings. But what did you hear the commissioner say when he was talking today? We're going to tighten up the AIS things. We're going to start issuing, stop issuing warnings and start cranking down on AIS. So the issue here is this is going to all tighten up this year, at least from what I heard the commissioner say. I know you said two minutes, but I'm going to keep going. Okay. I, us cat guys have been waiting a long time to get up here and talk to you guys. So you guys sit down and listen to that. This was a challenge that we were facing as a catfish work group. Working within the goals of the AIS program, is there a way to seek compromise that will allow the harvest to bait from infested waters and at the same time continue to control the spread of invasive species? What's the biggest complaint most of us got about government right now? They can't compromise worth a damn. Everybody's dug in and saying, this is what I'm going to do. Us catfish guys are saying to the DNR and everybody else, hey, we'll compromise. We, all we want to do is be heard, and we want some compromise on the way we traditionally fish. OK, I'm getting kind of wound up here. <laughs> This is the approach that we were going to take in approaching our compromise. Oops, this thing's kind of hard for me here. Before we can ask the Minnesota DNR to compromise on statutes and rules that are already in place, we must ensure that our proposals are well thought out and our proposals will not compromise the integrity of the existing safeguards. That was the approach we as a work, work, work group were going to take. Now, I'm a retired U.S. Army colonel. I have an extensive background in military operations, plans, and training. And so, when you're working things, you kind of fall back on what you got experience with. And one of the standard operating procedures in military planning is risk management. We do it every time we're planning a mission. 
we take that mission and we break it down and we analyze it to determine what the risks are and then we try to figure out based on those hazards and those risks what kind of controls can we put in place to mitigate those risks and I will say to you that that hasn't always happened when some of these regulations and stuff have been put into place it's so easy to say it's prohibited well come on I mean we've still got a fish going to stop us from fishing and, and sometimes we're going to as this thing gets bigger and harder to work that's the problems we're going to face we've got to come up with ways to compromise this so what we want to do is look at a risk management approach to our proposals that will ensure they bring a safe solution to the table and that's the approach our work group took as we went into meeting three so on the 13th of December, we had our third meeting, and I heard today we had a charter for three meetings, and maybe all we've had all of our meetings already, so I better get this on the table in case we don't get to meet again, okay? But this is what came out of our third meeting. I did a presentation to the group on risk management, and this is the definition of a risk. It's characterized by the combination of the probability that a program will experience an undesired event and then the consequences, impact, or severity of the undesired event were to occur. That's what a risk is. Risk management is a five-step process. I'm not going to read these to you. I'll just tell you, the first thing you do is identify the hazard or the risk, assess the hazard or the risk of the second step, develop controls, and then implement your controls. This is what the probability is. It's the likelihood an event will occur. And you try to categorize it in these five ways. I'm going fast now. This is the severity. Again, it's the expected consequences of an event, and those are the consequences. You take what your probability is, and you take what your severity is, and you use this matrix to come up with a low risk, a moderate risk, a high risk, and extremely high risk. This is the U.S. Army's risk assessment matrix. I figured if it worked for them, it should work for us. So I use this matrix to put together our plan. And then I put together a series of 11 questions that I posed to, the, to our work group. First two questions are the crux of the issue. Because I put the 11 issues up and, and a bunch of the guys wanted to go right to the how do you harvest bait thing. I said, stop, back up. We need to determine if this is even feasible. Questions one and two can be answered in the affirmative, then we'll look at the how do we harvest it and what can we harvest. These were the two questions. If bait is harvested in infested waters and used a lime on that body of water and not transported from that body of water, will it compromise the integrity of that statute? The second question was, if it's harvested in infested waters and cut up and used as cut bait, like that sucker I showed you, will that compromise the integrity of that statue? What do you guys think? It shouldn't. The fish are already in there. You're not taking them out of there. What are you hurting? All right? And we as a work group went, light bulb went on and said, no, no problem. Go to the next one tomorrow. Hurry up. Okay? Here's the other thing that we threw at them. I don't know if any of you know or not, but the fish that I showed you there as bait are rough fish. On inland waters, they're categorized as underutilized fish. Okay? Did you know that there's an open, continuous season on every one of those fish? Right now, you could go down there and you could catch a whole bucket, five-gallon bucket full of them and take them home. You can't transport them alive in water, but you can put them in a bucket and take them home. So we kind of said to ourselves, why is it legal to harvest them for possession, but not legal to harvest them for, for bait? And that was the kind of the crux of the question we asked ourselves. Then we asked three, a series of other questions. <coughs> this is the harvesting method. I got to ask you guys this. If bait is harvested using hook and line techniques and only used on those waters where it's hot, would it compromise the integrity of 84D03? Would it? It shouldn't, should it? So we went, no, that's okay. Do that one, okay? But what about if we used a cast or a throw net? 
How many know what a cast net is? The guy standing in front of the boat throws that big thing out there? Well, it's illegal in Minnesota, isn't it? Well, it also would, would probably compromise the integrity of that because once you throw that in the water and catch the bait, guess what? The net's contaminated. So now you got an issue with the net. So we as a work group said, no, let this go. So we let all of these go that talked about using seines, using traps, etc. And then we came down to the last two, the use of rough fish and the use of game fish. Well, we catfish guys really like the idea of using game fish for bait, but I know that most of you guys would panic at that to see us out there with 15 inch walleyes on the end of our hook. But, I gotta tell you that it's, it, is, it is done in other states. But we as a work group said, in the spirit of compromise, we don't even wanna go there. We don't wanna get in that fight, we don't wanna go there, so we X those out. And we thought those other two questions were good. Okay, so we as a work group got done and said, yes, let's do those. This is our final risk management worksheet that we put together. Here was our task, to find a compromise on our bait harvest issues that would allow the harvest of bait. These were the hazards to that, all right? And that was the transportation of infested waters or live infested bait. And this was assessing those hazards and it came out to an overall risk. If you just tried to do this without putting any controls in, the likelihood of that happening, let me go back here, was Probability was occasional and the severity was critical. So we come over here to occasional and we go down to critical and you'll see it puts us right here and it puts us in a high risk. So we said, as a work group, we said we can't do that. So let's put our controls in. What about if we have limited the harvest to hook and line? What about if we said the bait would be limited to use on the same body of water where you caught it? Or what about if we said we would not transfer any transport any bait alive from that body of water. With those controls in place, we determined what is called a residual risk. And we came down here and now it is unlikely and it is critical. We go over here and we say unlikely, we come down to critical and guess what? We've got a low risk now. So we are saying, here's where we're at, we've made our risk decision and we're saying it's a low risk. So right now, we want to implement those controls. That's step four, and we hit the wall. At that meeting, we hit the wall, because we tried to start to write down what we needed to do. And this was the intent of our, I know, shake your head. It's my last time here, I probably won't get invited back. <laughs> All right. The harvest of brush fish or legal minnows for bait, here's what we're saying. Up here where it says, in waters that are designated as infested waters, taking wild animals may be permitted for, for the harvest of rush fish or legal minnows for bait purposes from waters designated as, as infested is allowed for non-commercial personal use. And you guys can read the rest. I rest my case. That's my last slide. That's where we are when we hit the wall. We want to propose this to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources as a compromise position for the use of bait for catfish. And I thank you all for your attention. I'm sorry I ran over and have a great evening.